nonsense? Just whenever you're ready. Oh, so whenever I'm ready? Okay. Yes. I was born ready. Um, <laughs> hi guys. <laughs> I'm, uh, what's going on? Some of you know me in here. Some fans in here, I guess. I don't know. What's going on? I'm Terry. Um, I lived here for all of my life. I was raised here. I don't live here anymore, but I maintain, <laughs> I maintain um, my community ties as best I can. Um, I lived in that neighborhood down there, down yonder, East Dearborn. Lori Polar Bear Bears for Life. So um, I read about this on the social media. Thank God for social media. It keeps us all connected. And uh, I thought, well, this is cool. I'm going to come see what this is all about. So I, I wrote this about my grandmother um, a while ago. And I'm, I am i mean, it's not the best thing I've ever written, but I'm proud of it because um, I'm part of the immigrant, oh, I'm not an immigrant. I just snuck in. The Immigrant Writers Group at U of M um, Dearborn. I graduated there in 12. And one of the professors invited me in because uh, as a, a, a child of, people need to stop texting me, otherwise I'm not gonna be able to read this. Um, I do like it, I don't get some texts. Um, I'm so ashamed I don't have anything printed because so reading off my right phone, now. it's horrible. But um, squirrel, um, U of M, yeah. So I was invited to, to submit things to this writer's memoirs group and the professor reads it and he's like, okay, this is cool, we'll send it to the, uh, University of Michigan Ann Arbor's um, Bentley Historical Library and if you guys don't know this, it's a really cool section. It's like all of um, Dearborn, like we have pockets of obviously Arab Americans and the Polish community and, and things have been submitted and if you want to go learn about what life was like you know, back before you were born or your, when your parents came over, there's an entire section, there's boxes and boxes and boxes for example of um, the Islamic Center on Ford Road. Um, there's so much information um, about the leaders that came here and formed the mosque and where the first one was and it's, it's, it was really interesting. Like I was going through stuff and I'm like, I went to this Sunday school and that was my teacher and um, submitting things there, having things submitted. This is something that was submitted there so I'm, I'm pretty proud of it. So I'll shut up and I'll start reading. And I keep changing the title so just whatever. I was told I should listen to my grandmother. Sita was past 70 now, and she did not know her exact age or date of birth, as was common for her generation. I did not think she even had a birth certificate, and this troubled me. She was called Imaatif by her family and neighbors, referred to as Martali, or called Ben Selimi by some. I was vaguely aware of what my grandmother's name was. It was not entirely sure until I went to Lebanon in 1993, and I asked her myself, Sito, what's your name? My name, granddaughter? What does it matter now? My father was the only one who called me by my name, and I have not heard his voice since I was a girl right before I came to this miserable house and married your grandfather. I'm sorry, Sito. Why are you sorry? This is our lot in life, to marry young and to watch our babies die while our husbands are in Dubai and Qatar and Saudi Arabia working. This will not be your lot in life as you are an American. You will not have to watch your husband leave you with six children and two dead babies. I'm sorry for your trouble, Sito, but what is your name? My name? My name is Abdi. Do you know what that means, granddaughter? Do you understand? It means slave. No, Sito, it means slave of God. Call it what you want, granddaughter. Slave of God, slave of man, slave of kitchen, slave of house. Any way you look at it, it is slave. <laughs> Poor baby. I was taken aback by this revelation. I knew that this was a proper Islamic name, and it did not necessarily mean slave, and that worshiper or God's servant. I had not known my grandmother very long, but I had heard stories about her from my father, and these stories were not good. After my grandfather heard my father tell his mother to eat poison, as she sat on the floor of our living room, tears oozing out of her cataract-ridden eyes, her shoulders slumped over his bauble with his broad chest, hurled spit and insult at my grandmother. Her position on the floor near her prayer rug suggested that she was preparing for a blow, and next, wincing from what that blow as if she already knew where it would land due to many years of practice. The shock of this altercation between my father and grandmother was ne has never worn off. The shock stemming from guilt, as I could not save her because I would be a victim of the crossfire. My guilt was magnified by the notion that she somehow deserved this abuse. I was sent to Lebanon in 1993, a young girl of 15. Naive, innocent, and eager to please my family. Baba did not send me to Lebanon to meet my grandmother or learn about my culture or heritage. My father never did anything unless he was to profit. Even as a child, I knew that this trip was not a gift and that Baba was expecting payment upon my return to America. I was not happy yet. I was determined to seek some solace and try to forget my own problems and what brought me here to meet a potential husband and bring him back with me to the States. 
But as I came to learn more about my family, my focus was on my grandmother. I would not try to, to understand this tired, defeated, hardened old woman who was at best miserable. She lost her land and her inheritance when she married my grandfather. Sito's father had the misfortune of fathering six girls, but he had been wealthy. My great-grandfather had left parcels of land to his daughters, and for some reason my grandmother was bequeathed the most vast areas of land and a large sprawling house complete with an outdoor oven and two tiny room and a two tiny room shack that could house passing relatives or a servant along with their meager belongings. My grandfather knew this would be an opportunity for him as he himself had five sisters. His father had farmed all his life and not all of his daughters had married. He had been a kind and gentle father. He had loved his daughters and despite his wife's protests, he would not marry them off before they were at least 16. This had made life a bit difficult for my grandfather, Ali. So when he was 18, he decided to marry the recently orphaned Abdi. Ali had been told that Abdi was a hard worker, that she was spared the work in the fields because her father had been wealthy and could afford hired help, and that despite this, she was obedient. Abdi had worked aside her mother, helping with her siblings and learning to cook. She could mend clothing, sew dresses, and she could read and write a bit. To my astonishment, this was quite an accomplishment for a girl of her time. No village girl was expected to read or write, but my great-grandfather had the patience to teach his child, and he did. I was told that Sitto had once had a softness and kindness about her, but now one look into her heart and eyes and you could tell that she had toiled all her married life, that she hated all children, including her own, except her youngest, Bissam, and that she hated her husband even more. I picked up on these things despite my broken Arabic, and I knew that even though it was my father that had sent her a living allowance each month, and that it was my father who had visited Lebanon twice a year to maintain and update the house, that she hated him the most. My father had hopes that the house would be more comfortable. My grandmother viewed me as an American grandchild, second best, ignorant of culture and religion due to my upbringing, and I knew that she viewed me as nothing but a chore. So if I was summoned by this disagreeable, hurtful old woman, I would obey. I followed Sito into the formal sitting room of my father's childhood home. Baba had made many improvements to this house since he left Lebanon in 1972. There were modern day conveniences like a kitchen in the main part of the house, updates to the bathrooms, and running water. There were two bedrooms, one for my grandfather and the other for my uncle, who had since left the house to join Baba in America. I was not allowed to sleep in that bedroom. I think that my grandfather was making it sort of a shrine with the belief my grandmother was making it sh something short of a, a shrine with the belief that her beloved youngest child would someday come home. I rolled out a mat and slept in the formal living room. It was a very uncomfortable setup. I was used to having my own space in my own bedroom back at home in the States. My grandmother could not fathom this idea. She had slept in one room with all of her children, my grandfather in his room when he was home. But as her children got older, Sita began to sleep in the kitchen. A glimpse of my elderly grandmother, ripe with disease and hardship, sleeping on a thin mat on the kitchen floor depressed me. I was captivated by the profound sadness that this woman still carried in her heart for her dead children. I marveled over the fact that she still wept for her children, who had died decades earlier. She had once said that she could still see little Husni running down the hallway, his nightgown ballooning behind him, his feet slapping the cold tiles. She could still hear little Hassan's laughter, a twinge of sadness at the end of his laughter, she told me, because either he knew that his days of laughter were numbered, or because the sound of dying laughter scared him. Either way, Situ knew that Hassan would not live to see his second birthday. And she told me that she knew this the moment he was born. So when she held him more often, she nursed him longer. She never hit or scolded him. She always put him beside her at night. These were the things that broke my heart about Situ. I could not understand how a woman of her age who began birthing children at 14 could even comprehend his this type of heartache. Wouldn't the heart soon forget? Sorry, I lost my place. I did not understand this until I was a mother myself, and I regret casting this selfish notion onto her. When she told me this story, when she wept and cried into her hijab, I did not go to her as I should have. I did not hold her hand or try to comfort her. I merely listened, and I imagined that Hassan and Husni were better off. I followed Situ into the living room, and she asked me to bring down a suitcase that had been stored in an armoire in the sitting room. As I opened the suitcase, an odor immediately hit me. This must have been where Situ stored all of her medicine, creams, and ointments. I did not understand what she was asking of me. After a much labored discussion, my grandfather wanted to know why the arthritis cream that my father had been sending her from America smelled like mint, when the cream that her sister son had sent her smelled awful. As it turns out, my poor Sito had been rubbing crust on her hip and brushing her teeth with Ben Gay. We laughed about this for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and now, so nine years after her death, my family still laughs about this. I remember hearing Sito laugh for the first time. I think that she was 
surprised at herself or saddened because she knew that her days of laughter had been few and far between. Laughter had not come easy for my grandmother, Abdi, for she had labored hard all her life. Thank you very much. With that, with that, today's the open mic. The next meeting.